Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. This is a most unusual experience for me tonight because I've looked forward since a little boy to have one time that I could minister to the people of Maine. When just a little lad, I used to come here to go hunting up around Moosehead Lake, Squaw Pond, Pittston Farm, back in them territories there. And I would meet such nice people, I just wondered if Maine wasn't just full of those kind of people. And I've been in your lovely city here for two days, and I found it so. Real, honest people. You know, they say Southern hospitality. Well, they, I guess this is what you call Northern hospitality. Well, they're just as nice people here as I've ever seen in my life for five times around the world. So I'm certainly happy to be here tonight and this lovely auditorium and to see this nice gathering for this kind of a way away city from the big cities and your enthusiasm and, and your love for Christ to come out like this to the first night to someone that perhaps never heard of me before in your life. So that's mighty fine. I appreciate this. Sorry, we only have one night. I suppose if we had eight or ten days here for a regular campaign, the Lord would do great things among us, which he will tonight. We are looking forward to that. Now, we do not come to represent any certain denomination of church. We, I myself was ordained in a missionary Baptist church, and then I never... Was, I never just left the church. I just started standing between the breaches between the different denominations and just on these meetings of praying for the sick and what influence that the Lord has given me. I do not wish to, to give it all into one denomination. It's for the entire body of the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of what church they belong to. And I used to herd cattle a lot in my days in the West, and I noticed when we would take the cattle up to the forest, while well, the ranger would stand there checking those cattle at the drift fence. Many of the times have I sat there with my leg hooked around the horn of the saddle watching, and the ranger didn't pay so much attention to the brand that was on the cattle. It was a, it was a breed of the cow. The blood that was in the cow, it had a tag, and it must be a third-bred Hereford or it could not go on the forest. That was the main thing. And I think that's the way it'll be at the day of the judgment. It won't be exactly what brand we're wearing, it's what blood we're under. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will be the marking for his children. Some of us might say we're Methodists or Baptists or Assemblies of God or Apostolic Faith or whatever it is, but it'll be all that's under the blood, I believe, will go in at that day. And so I'm expecting to be with you there at that great gathering that all human beings have looked forward to through the ages. Now, we talk about divine healing mostly in my meeting, but divine healing is not what we try to major with. You can never major on a minor. Divine healing is just a, a gift to present Christ in the way of divine healing, to catch the peace people's attention, to let them know that Jesus loves them. And the main healing that we're after is the healing of the human soul, that men that are born again have eternal life and shall never perish but be raised up again at the last day. And then you take the church of your choice. We're going from here down to a little... Another city below us here, Bangor, I believe, Maine. And uh, we're going to be there the last of uh, this week and the first of next week, six days. It'll be the longest stay we've had in the in these New England campaigns. And if you live near there, we'll be looking forward to seeing you with great anticipation. And expect maybe in that meeting we're, we'll maybe get more acquainted one or two nights, you just get to say, well, I wonder. After a while, then, away we go, goodbye, and 
You don't get to see them no more. But when we can, for a few nights till you can see God is real, proven real. Now, I believe that the campaign theme is that Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, we wish to read a little scripture just in a moment. And I want to say to the ones who are sponsoring here, to the pastors, we certainly thank you for this opportunity, my dear brethren. And I do pray that God of heaven will bless you exceedingly abundantly and give you the desire of your heart. Now, before we open his precious word, any man that's a woman, child, is able physically can turn the pages back, but it takes the Holy Spirit to really open the word to our heart, for it's written by the Holy Spirit. The Bible said even men of old, when they were moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote the Bible. So therefore, it's inspired. No human being has a right to say, we have the interpretation, no one else does. The Holy Spirit has the interpretation. And let's ask him tonight if he will interpret for us uh, while we read and pray. Now we bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Now, especially for you people who've never been in the meeting before, I want you to be real sincere now and say, God, let me just lay aside every prejudice of my heart. You who are here that's sick, say, God, be merciful to me. This surely will be my night for him. Let the sinner say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, while we pray. Most holy and reverent God, we come into thy presence first in the name of the Lord Jesus. For it has been taught us by his blessed holy word that if we would ask the Father anything in his name, we should receive it. So therefore we have no name or no honor to meet thee by, and we come humbly, reverently in his honorable and holy name, knowing according to his word that you will hear, and we'll have this talk with you. Now this meeting has been set together, Father, thy watch every move, and it's for no other purpose but for the glory of God and for the help of his great church, the body of his Son, invisible. And we pray, Father, that you will heal all the sick that's in the building tonight. May there not be a feeble person leave this building, but what will be made completely whole. May the sinner, Lord, the unbeliever, become so ashamed and embarrassed in the presence of the great Holy Spirit that he or she will say, God, be merciful to me and be saved this night. Grant, Lord, that those who are kind of withering or are falling along the way, those feeble hands that have been hanging down, those who are getting cold and indifferent as they're waiting for the coming, may they take new courage tonight and rise in the strength of the Lord. God grant that you'll give something of blessing in this neighborhood tonight that'll start an old-fashioned revival in every home, in every church, and in everywhere through the country. Lord, we realize we don't have too much time left according to the the calendar of time to labor because the sun is swiftly setting and the end time is near. So help us to conduct ourselves tonight as your beloved children and work through us by the Holy Spirit, for we ask that in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus, amen. I wish to approach the word now. Just the little scripture that I use on usually the first night to introduce to you the calling that the Holy Spirit has given me. And firmly being a fundamentalist who believes God's eternal word, 
believing that everything that God has written is part of himself. I believe the scripture says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So therefore this Word is part of God. And if we'll approach it like that, approach his Word like we were approaching him, for no man is any better than his Word is. If I could not take your word, I would not believe you for anything. Same you should by me. That's the way I do by God. If God made a promise, and if he's the Almighty God, we must stay by his promise to maintain his position as Almighty God. We cannot make a promise and then take it back. I can make a promise and have to take it back. You will make a promise and have to take it back because we are man and we're we're finite. But he's infant. God cannot get wiser, smarter. He was perfect to begin with. And when God makes a statement, it's perfect. And if God makes a statement in a crisis and the way he approaches that crisis, If that same crisis arise again, he's got to approach it in the same manner, the same way that he did the first time, or he did wrong the way he approached it the first time. You see, if God heals sick people to begin with, when a crisis was when Moses had no remedies for the sick and God raised up a brass serpent in the wilderness and made an atonement for the sick and afflicted because there was a crisis. Then if that crisis comes to a place again where there is no remedies to help us, God has to act the same way to us or he acted wrong when he acted for Moses. He's God. He cannot change. He never knows no more, no less. He's perfect forever. And I want to read a portion of his word found in St. John 12. And the 20th verse. And then Hebrews 13, 8 for a text. And there were certain Greeks among them came up to the feast to worship. The same therefore came to Philip, which was the Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And in Hebrews 13, 8, it's written, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now we want to look at this. Do you believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Would you believe that because the Bible says so? If you would, I'd like to just raise your hand. Every believer. Well then, thank you. If God has said that he is the same, then he must be the same, or the scripture is wrong. And if the scripture is wrong in one place, I'd be afraid to trust it because it might be wrong in another place. It's got to all be right or it's all wrong. For instance, if we were all in this room tonight starving to death, and some great multi millionaire would come to the door and say, Tomorrow at nine o'clock, I'm going to give fifty people in here a thousand dollars. No one could have faith. If he said, I'm going to give one person in here a thousand dollars tomorrow, no one could have faith. You might be the one and you might not be. The only way you can have faith is saying, I'll give every one of you a thousand dollars. Then we can all have faith. Whosoever will, let him come, says the scripture. It's on whosoever will. It's up to you if you come. The invitation is given. Now we want to notice, these Greeks who came up to the worship, they had an enthusiasm that they wanted to see Jesus. And I believe that that is the desire of every heart 
of every person that ever heard his name, they want to see who that is. I know it's the desire of my heart, and I'm sure it's the desire of every heart that's here. Sirs, we would see Jesus, and he was taken, these Greeks were taken to Jesus by a minister by the name of Philip, who went and got Andrew, and they take him to Jesus. Now, if their desire was to see him and got to see him, and our desire is to see him, and the Bible said that he remains the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why can't we see him? Now, in my city, there was a little boy some time ago who got all enthused in his Sunday school, and when he went home, he said to his mommy, Mommy, can anyone see this great God that they're telling us about? She said, ask your Sunday school teacher. And she asked the teacher, or he did, rather, ask the lady teacher, and she said, ask the pastor. And they asked the pastor, and the pastor said, No, Sonny, no one can see God and live. Well, the little fellow, that did not satisfy his enthusiasm. So he used to fish up on the river with an old fisherman down there by the name of Wiseheart. He used to be a deacon in our church. And he, one day coming down the river, there'd come a storm. Been a dusty summer, and... The water had washed all the leaves off, and the sun was setting in the west as the old fishermen, the little boy, made their ways down after running the net. And there was a rainbow came out. And as the old fisherman watched that rainbow, the little fellow noticed that tears began to run down his bearded cheeks, and the crystal tears dropping off of his white beard. Kind of stirred the emotion of the little boy. So he ran from the stern of the boat up into the middle and he fell down on the lap of the old fisherman and he said, Sir, I'm going to ask you something that seemingly no one can answer me. And he said, What is it, my lad? He said, God is so great, the God that made that rainbow said, Can anyone see God? And the old fisherman, overcome by the child's enthusiasm, put him in his arms and he said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for 40 years has been God. The way to see God is to get God on the inside. See the see your eyes. When you know him, you can understand him. He will reveal himself. Jesus said, A little while, and the world see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Anyone who reads the Scriptures knows that's true. Then Jesus promised by his own word that there would be people that would see him until he came again at the end of the world. A little while, and the world will see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I, a personal pronoun, will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. That is that scripture right? Or was he just teasing the disciples? If he was teasing and Jasting and carrying on, then he wasn't the Son of God. That's either the truth or it is not the truth. And now you say, well, Brother Branham, I believe that God lives in the flowers, so do I. But these groups wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to see him. Now you said in the scriptures, in the writings, that the works that I do shall you do also. Now, to really justify this statement then, we would have to go back into Scripture 
and get what Jesus was yesterday, if we want to know what he'll be today. Now I want to ask you in the audience tonight, would that not be a fair thing before Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, and Protestants, and what more, each one saying, my church pleases it this way, my church pleases it this way, which is perfectly all right. But if you really want to see what he was yesterday, so you know what he is today, is to go back in the scripture and see what he was yesterday. Then we don't have the church's word, we have God's own word about it. Now, what he was yesterday, he has to remain the same today, or he isn't the same yesterday and today. Now, in his promise, he said, The works that I do shall you do also. More than this shall you do. Now, I know the King James here says greater, but if you get the right original translation on it, it says more. No one could do greater. He stopped nature, raised the dead, healed the sick, or done everything. You cannot do any greater, but God, the Holy Spirit, would be in the church universal all around the world at one time. Just like all the ocean, water, that's the God gave Jesus the Spirit without measure. In him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He was God manifested in the flesh. The Bible said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But when he gave out his spirit to we adopted sons, he gives us a bucket full out of that ocean. He had all the fullness of the Godhead. We just have a portion of it as a gift of the Holy Spirit. But if I took one bucket full of water out of the ocean, or even a teaspoonful of it out of the ocean, the same chemicals that's in the entire ocean would be in that spoonful. Be just less in quantity, not less in quality. So the same Holy Spirit that was in Christ is in his church. Now, listen, to strengthen that for you. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Now, the, the vine does not bear fruit. The vine only purges the branch, and the branch bears fruit. Therefore, the only way Jesus could speak tonight would be through my lips or your lips. My hands or your hands. My life or your life. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He doesn't bear fruit anymore. He just purges his church and it bears fruit. Now what kind of fruit would it bear? If the life that was in him is in his church, it'll bear the same kind of life that he bore when he was here. Do you understand? Notice, if you went to a grapevine, you'd expect to find grapes. And down south, I don't know where you have them here, we have pumpkins down there. And if you go to a pumpkin vine, you expect to get pumpkins if it's a good fertile vine. Watermelons, you get watermelons off of a watermelon vine. And if we come to the vine Christ, his church, what do we find? Fussing, stewing, Arguments over theology, hatred, malice, strife, and we call that the works of God. The scripture says that is not so. This will all men know when you're my disciples, when you've got love one for the other. The love of God in his church, making every member a part of him. Then upon that rock and that foundation he builds his church. Notice. Now let's to take too much of your time. Hours could be spent on that showing what he promised. But now the subject is, 
Is he the same today that he was then? Is he the same in every way, only a corporal body? Now, when his body comes, then we'll go home with him. For his body has been raised up and set on the throne of God tonight to make intercession on our confession. He is a priest, high priest of our confession, Hebrews 3, 1. Then he's sitting there as a high priest, and may I say this, there's no other mediator between God and man but Jesus Christ. The scripture says so. And he is the only one that stands between God and man to make intercession. And the scripture says that he is the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Now let's go back and see what he was. I read from St. John 12. Now for you dear people here from the, the regions and the city around about, when you get home tonight or in the morning in the quietness of the day, you women, when your husband is at work, or you, sir, just before you go to bed tonight or tomorrow night, at your noon hour if you carry your Bible, turn over to St. John 1. And let's find out what he was yesterday. Now, any of the, of the scriptures will declare him, but we're reading in St. John 1. After he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, God came and was made manifest. Forty days in the wilderness, he came out and he starts his ministry. Now, I want to ask you a question, and I want you to answer me by your hand, being lifted. If we can find out what he was yesterday, and he will come here tonight among you people and declare himself the same today as he was yesterday, how many of you will receive him? Let's see your hands. Well, up in the air now, every believer. Thank you. Let's watch what he was. Now, the first place, the reason that this phenomena is going on today is because this is the ending of the Gentile church age. Uh, any scholars know that. That we're at the end. When Jesus was here in a body of flesh, he did not go to the Gentiles. And he forbid his disciples to go to the Gentiles. He said, I was not sent to them. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go preach, saying, the kingdom is the hand, and so forth. And he never visited the Gentiles. Because there was a 2,000 year space to call the church out to all nations. But in St. John 1, we find that there was a man got saved, and quickly he went and got his brother. Now, that's a good sign that he got saved. He went and found his brother. And when he brought his brother to him, Jesus, he was a fisherman. And the Bible said he was ignorant and unlearned. He could not even sign his own name. And when he came in the presence of the Lord Jesus, Jesus said to him, Your name is Simon. And your father's name is Jonas. What do you think that ignorant and unlearned fisherman thought when a man who had never seen him in his life or neither had he ever seen this man, when he walked into his presence, told him who he was and who his father was? Has anybody ever read that in the scripture? St. John, the first chapter, about the eighth verse. And this man looked at him, and he became a servant of the Lord Jesus. His name was called Cepheus by the Lord Jesus later, and that was St. Peter. The man who could not sign his own name. 
the man that was called ignorant and unlearned had the keys to the kingdom give to his hand. Now, you see what we've done with it? We tried to educate the people to Christ. You just might as well forget it. There's no other program will do it but the old fashioned program, the new birth being born again, is the only way that it'll ever be. We tried to to educate them, we have tried to make societies and so forth to bring the people to a brotherhood and it separates them further away from God. And we become prejudiced and build up denominational walls and separate ourselves from the other brethren. But a real good old time case of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your heart, it'll make you forget your pride. It'll make a tuxedo suit put his arms around a pair of overhauls and call him brother. It'll make a silk dress put her arms around a calico, say sister. It does something on the inside of you. It goes beyond an intellectual conception. It's a birth of the spirit that lives in the human heart. Now, as soon as he told that to Simon, he became his servant. Immediately then, Philip got all enthused and he said he had another friend. And he went around the mountain, 15 miles, to find his friend, Nathaniel. Let's follow him just a few moments. And he goes in and perhaps Mrs. Nathaniel was at the house and he says, Where is uh, Nathaniel at? Oh, he went out to the orchard just a while ago. Out in the orchard he goes, and there he finds Nathaniel out there under a tree, as any good, loyal person would be praying. As a Christian gentleman, of course, he would interrupt him when he was praying. After he got through, I can just see Nathaniel raise up and say, Well, if you're in Philip, I want you, he's got a message. Without receiving his introduction or anything, he said, Come, he who we found. I wonder what would take place if this little group of people here in this building tonight would be that enthused about Jesus. I wonder what would take place if one of these little churches around here would get that enthused about Jesus that all is on your heart. Your, your first is first and that's God. The first thing is Jesus. Come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Oh, now, you know, this here fellow Nathaniel was orthodox, very straight, good fellow. And I can hear him say to Philip, now wait just a minute, Philip. You must have went off on the deep end of something. You mean to tell me that the son of God would come out of Nazareth? That little group of people down there that's mean? If the Son of God, the Messiah, was here, he'd come to the temple. He would come to the to Jerusalem and not to Nazareth. I'll say this with love and respect, but that's the same way they think it today. They can't believe. Oh, you Catholics would say he'd come to the Vatican City. You let the Pope know. And you Presbyterians would say, oh, he'd let the bishop know. And so forth. All of us. But God does things in his own way. And it's always contrary to the way the clergy has it figured out. Always. You historians know that. Never in any age did the clergy have it right. To you Catholics, to you Protestants, first, what about Elijah? They didn't believe he went home on a chair. They sent the little children down behind Elijah saying, you bald head, why didn't you go up? 
And the prophet cursed those children. And a curse come on them and two she bears killed forty two little children. How about Moses? When Jesus was here, he said, the disciples said to him, said, why does the scribes say, the ministers, why do they say that Elijah must first come? He said, he's already come and you didn't know him. And they know he spoke of John the Baptist. Now to you Catholics, what about St. Patrick? Did the church recognize him? They thought he was a witch. But after he was dead and the message had been given, then the church received him. What about St. Francis of Assisi? A walking preacher with a Bible in his arm, he protested the Catholic Church. When he went to preach down in the corner that day, and the little birds was the holler, and he said, Sisters, you stand still. Keep still while I'm preaching. And they obeyed him. And after he was dead, now he's canonized a saint in your church. How about Joan of Arc? Any school girl would know her, about her. A little girl who saw visions and angels and had revelations. And your church, the Catholic Church, burnt her to a state crying for mercy. Calling her the same thing they called Jesus, Beelzebub. A witch. Joan of Arc was burnt as a witch to a stake by the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic. And about a hundred years later, they found out she was a witch. She was a saint. But God sent his message through just the same. And they failed to see it. They didn't know who the Son of God was until he was dead, buried, in and rose again. God's sovereign. He does his worst. And it's the church must wake up here in these last days. It's such a pitiful thing. A few weeks ago in my city, Louisville, there's a lady going around with a little baby in a ten cent store. And she was showing it saying, Then look there. And the little fellow stared. And she'd show him something. Now, look, honey. And the little fellow kept staring. Reckon she went to a counter that had a little trinket that rattled. And she shook it before him. And the little fellow just stared right out in space, and she fell across the counter exhausted and crying, and some of the people went to her to see what was wrong. She said, not long ago, he just tucked away and staring, looking right straight ahead. Said he's a little human being, and he ought to notice things that pertain to this human life. The doctor told me a while ago he was better, but said he's not. And I wonder if that isn't just about the way of the church today. God is shaking every kind of a gift in front of the church. And it just sits and stares. Say, well, I suppose that's pretty good. If it had been in my denomination, we might have accepted it. Don't you see? Spiritually, instead of mentally, paralyzed. The church that there's been Billy Grins, there's been old robbers, there's been great men, Jack Shoes and what more. In the last few years it's called these nations. And still they just the church just said, Well, I'm this my church you get those ideas. And Nathaniel had the same idea. He said, Now just a minute, if there's anything good could come out of an address. It wouldn't be the Son of God. He'd come to the high priest. And I think Philip, giving the best answer that anybody could give him, he said, come and see. Now that's sensible, logical, correctly. Come and see for yourself. Don't stay home. Come out and find out for yourself. Come and see. And I said, and besides that, he told him who his daddy was and what his name was. Oh, now, just a minute, Nathaniel would say to Philip, Phil, I believe you went off on the deep end. You come find out for yourself. They came up into the crowd where Jesus was. They, maybe they were out in the, in the audience, or maybe they were in the prayer line. When Jesus saw him for the first time, he said, Behold an Israelite. 
in whom there is no God. I remember the first of his ministry, here he introduced himself to the Jewish generation in this manner. Behold an Israelite in whom is no God. Well, I, you say, well, he was dressed. No, he could have been an Arab, he could have been a Greek. Most any nation, all the Orients dressed the same. Said, so behold, an Israelite. How do you know he was an Israelite? In whom there is no God. And when he said that, it astonished him so much that he said, Rabbi, when did you know me? I've never saw you and you've never saw me. When did you know me? He said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. How many knows the scripture says that? That was Jesus yesterday. That's the way he made himself known to the Jews. Now, oh, there were those who stood by, which was of the great high churches, the Orthodox. You know what they said in their heart? They said, this man is a fortune teller. He is the Beelzebub. He reads their minds. They said that in their heart, and Jesus perceived their thoughts. And he said, listen what he said, Verily I say unto you, you speak that against me, the Son of Man, I'll forgive you for it. But when the Holy Ghost has come to do the same thing, one word against it will never be forgiven in this world nor in the world that is to come. How many knows the scripture says that? Then where do we stand tonight if he declares himself by the Holy Ghost that he's just the same? A few days later we find him in St. John the fourth chapter, just before closing. And we find him in the fourth chapter of St. John. Now he did not go to the Gentiles. We did not perform that sign one time to the Gentiles, just to the Jews. But here he is in the front of the Samaritans. And he sends his disciples away because he was tired. And he sat down in a little panoramic, something like this here, where there's a, if you've ever been there, the well's still there, just outside the gate of Samaria. Jacob dug it. And it's about noontime, and the disciples went into the city to buy some food. And while they were gone, Jesus resting, because he did the preaching and the healing of the sick and so forth, he was tired and weary. And the Father, no doubt, had told him to go there because in St. John 5, 19, he was questioned over a healing of a man, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. How many ever read that? St. John 5. Then Jesus never performed one miracle until God showed him by a vision what to do first. There it is. St. John 5, 19. I do nothing in myself for what I see the Father doing. The Father worketh and I worketh hitherto. That's what he said. Now here he is. The Father had sent him up there to Samaria and, and the disciples had gone into the city. And let's think she was a beautiful young woman. She comes out though she was ill-famed. She came out to get some water and when she started to let the pot down, if you was ever in the Orient, they can pack them on their head and on their hips and the women all go out there and they got a window and they drop this little hook around it and let it down and get a jug full of water and set one on top of their head and one on each hip and walk right around talking just like ladies can and never spill a drop of water. That big jug of two or three gallons set on top of their head, one on each hip. And they just walk right along talking. And this woman come out to get her water, perhaps. If you know, she was a woman of ill fame, so she couldn't come there when the rest of the women did. They didn't mix up together like they do today. And when she came out to get the water, she looked over there and there sat a Jew, a man that was only 32 years old, but he looked like he was 50. St. John 6. When he said, in there they said, you say you were greater than, than Abraham? And you're a man not 50 years old yet? We know now you've got a devil. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And that I am was a pillar of fire in the burning bush. You know that? The angel of the covenant. And when he was here on earth, 
He said, I came from God and I go back to God. Is that right? Then that pillar of fire, the angel of the covenant, that Moses forsook Egypt, sustaining the reproach of Christ, greater riches than that, the treasures of Egypt. Then when he was made flesh and dwelt in a body here, he said, I come from God and I go to God. Is that right? And after his death, burial, and resurrection, Paul was on his road down to Damascus to arrest those people who were making so much noise. And something struck him down. A pillar of fire standing there that blinded him. And he said, Saul, Saul, why uh, persecuted thou me? He said, Who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Return back to the Father again. A pillar of fire. That's the scripture. Later he came into the prison when he was having a prayer meeting at John Mark's house and opened the doors before the apostle Peter and set him free. And pardon this if it seems like it's personal. On this picture tonight, you see the, not mine, but you see the same pillar of fire as George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI, said so. Only photograph supernatural being was ever proved hangs in Washington, D.C. in the Religious Hall of Art. With George J. Lacey's name signed to it, the only supernatural being was ever photographed. Germany's got it now when they take it last year. If it is, it'll perform the same things that it did back there because it's divine. And if it's connected in the branches, it'll bring forth the same power and the same presence and the same work. Got to you. Or he's the same. Now watch its works and see if it's him or not. Judge it by the fruit it bears. If it's the same spirit, then it'll do the same thing. The works that I do shall you also. And here he is sitting at the well, and this woman was standing there, and he said, Woman, bring me a drink. And she said, We got segregation here. It's not customary for you Jews to ask Samaritans such. I'm a Samaritan woman. He said, But woman, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And she said, do you say that the well is deep and you have nothing to draw with? And you're greater than our father Jacob who dug the well and his cattle drank and so forth. What was he doing? Contacting her spirit. And as soon as he found where her trouble was, he said, go get your husband and come here. She said, sir, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right. You've got, had five and the one you're living with is not yours. Now what did she say? You are... You are Beelzebub? You have a mental telepathy? You are a fortune teller? No. She knows more about the Gospels than half the preachers in the United States. Being a prostitute. She knows more about it than the educated priests and rabbis of her day. Watch what this prostitute woman done. She looked him straight in the face and she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. Is that the sign of the Messiah? When the Messiah cometh, we know we Samaritans. We know this will be the sign of the Messiah. When he comes, he'll do these things. But who are you? Jesus said, I'm he that speaks with you. If that was the sign of the Messiah yesterday, it's got to be the same today. If he remains the same, declaring himself, there are both Jew and Samaritan, he declared himself. What did she do? She ran into the city and said, Come see a man told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? What would we Christians think about it tonight if he did that? Just wonder. She'll probably raise the day of judgment and condemn Many scholars and preachers and priests today. She recognized it. And she said, come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? And out come the man. And when they heard him, they were persuaded that was the Messiah. Now notice, he did that, that sign to the Jew to prove to the Jew 
to get the elected and sealed to the doom, the priests and rabbis and the unbelievers. Philip, all the rest of them believed him. And then when he made himself known to the Samaritans, he did the same thing. But not one time did he ever do it before a Gentile. And forbid it to be done. Why? Two thousand years has come now for the Gentiles to get the training and teaching. But in the end of the Jewish dispensation, before they met chaos, if he declared himself that way to the Jews to prove he was Messiah and he acted that way to prove it, he's got to act the same thing at the close of the Gentiles, or he isn't the same yesterday, today, and forever. You understand? Raise up your hands if you do. You understand that's true? He must do it. He couldn't ask for the Jews to declare himself that way to be the Jew. There's only three races of people. That's Jew, Samaritan, and Gentile. Ham, Sam, and Jacob's people. The three sons of Noah. That's all there is. So to Ham and to Japheth's people, or Shem's people rather, he's already declared himself and left the Gentiles to this age. And right in the closing of it, when the Sputniks is in the skies and the handwriting's on the wall, and nations are trembling, here he is among us, having his picture taken, the scientific world stands speechless on it. No one can come, he said, except my father draws him first. Jesus didn't die to save the entire world he wanted to, but he died to save those who God by foreknowledge knew would be saved. Not all men will come to him. God takes his man, but never his spirit. The devil takes his unbeliever, but never the spirit. It remains on in others. And those two spirits are battling it out right now. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One more quotation, if you'll spare it just a moment. So that you people, if just one night you won't have all of you a chance to get up in the prayer line. Now listen close as I close. I have read to you and quoted you out of God's eternal word. And Jesus said, how many knows that Jesus claimed not to be a healer? You mean you don't believe that? The Bible said... Jesus said himself, It's not me that doeth the work. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the work. St. John 5, 19, He went to a great big place where there was ten times as many crippling, blind, afflicted people as sitting in this building tonight. At the beautiful gate of the pool. Lame, halt, blind, withered. And here he comes through that crowd looking around. Until he found a man laying on the pallet. And he said, Will thou be made whole? Why didn't you say to the lame or blind man? And he said, I have no one to put in the water, sir. While I'm coming, he could walk. He'd had it 38 years. It wasn't going to kill him. He was retarded. He said, When I'm coming towards the water, someone else steps ahead of me. He said, Take up your bed and go on. There he went. They, and the rabbis and priests picked him up. So Jesus has brought the question. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, otherwise, why don't you heal all the rest of them? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this on the Sabbath? He said, Verily, verily, that's absolutely, absolutely. I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. The Father showed him that man was there and in that condition. Same thing he did the woman at the well. Same time he did it, Philip, on back. That was God working through his Son. Now, tonight, God's universal in all of his church as the vine, and we're the branches. Now, there was a woman one time who couldn't get to him. And she said within herself, if I can touch that man's garment, I'll be made well. And she pressed through the crowd and said there were priests and the so she got to where he was, and everybody patting him on the back. Rabbi, we're glad to have you over here. He is on his way to raise up Jairus' daughter. And this little woman just touched his garment. Now, if you ever seen the Palestinian garment that hangs loose, it's got an underneath garment. She, he couldn't have felt that physically. 
she touched his garment, and she went off and sat down or stood up wherever it was out of the audience. Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? Who touched me? And Peter, looking at the way a man would look today, he rebuked him and said, Why do you say who touched you? Everybody's touched you. He said, But I've gotten weak. Virtue's gone from me. Somebody's touch was a different kind of a touch otherwise. That's the touch we're talking about. Not the intellectual conception, but something that comes from here that really touches. Oh, sure, we, I touched him, I put my name on the church book, I joined the church, I was baptized, I, that's a touch, all right. That ain't a touch to defeat him. Who touched me? Nobody said nothing. And he looked out into the audience until he found the little woman. And he told her what had happened. Her troubles was a blood issue. And said, your faith has saved you. Brother, sister, if I never meet you again, until it's at the judgment seat of Christ, for the deeds of sin in their bodies shall be made manifest. Let me ask you this question, you answer me sanely. If he's a high priest today that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, wouldn't he have to act in the same manner that he did then if he is the same? Wouldn't he? If you could set my body and with, if the Bible says, how many ministers here knows that? That the New Testament, the book of Hebrews said that he's a high priest now that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The ministers, raise up your hand. Clergyman, your pastor knows that. What is he? A high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Then if he remains the same yesterday and forever, how would he answer? The same as he did yesterday. You touch him tonight. Say, Lord God, I won't be in that prayer line. I have no prayer cards. So I won't be called up there, but oh God, let me touch you. See what he does. See if you don't work. If you're a part of the vine yourself and his spirit here, you'll speak right back to him. Using the gift to manifest and prove that he's just the same that he ever was. No matter where you are. Just take John at his word tonight and believe it with all your heart. And God will make it manifest. If he will do such in the presence of you, I don't say that he will. If he will do such, I trust that you believe him and accept him. And remember now, as we're closing, this is the end of the Gentile age. Never in history has it been until now. This is the end time. He's had Mr. Billy Graham, a great spirit like John the Baptist that went forth doing no miracles. How many ministers here know that history, church history, and prophecy repeats itself at least once or twice? Yeah. You believe? Matthew 3, I think if I call my son, we say that back and see if it wasn't Jacob. That was his son too. History repeats itself. And there was a great spirit just in his first coming. There was a great spirit before the destruction of the Jews and the form of John the Baptist who did no miracles at all but was a mighty preacher. Following him came a spirit that did not be a forceful preacher but just signs and wonders begin to take place everywhere. Just at the closing of the age. This is the closing of the Gentile age. Let us pray. Lord God, it is so hard, Lord, to try to speak all that's in your heart in one little chopped up message, knowing that there may be people here that will, we'll never see each other's face again until we meet at that day yonder at your feet. Oh, God, let us act tonight as real Christians, as real sons and daughters of God. Give us faith to believe your word and stand when we read in the days of your when men and women who were cowardly and back back and even those like Nicodemus who slipped around. But oh, how we admire that one who stepped right out in such a position. God, I pray tonight that you'll do that to everyone in here. Give them such a, a blessing of the moving of the Spirit that every person in here will take their position as real believers. 
Grant it, Lord. Heal the sick and afflicted. And we are taught in the Scriptures that when one day, the first day after you rose from the dead, on that first Easter morning, there were two men by the name, one of them's name, and we cannot tell, and the other was Theophius, and they were on their way down to another little city called Emmaus. And as they went along talking about the Scripture, and about you, you stepped out of the bush and walked with them all day long, and they didn't realize who you were. And Father, I'm sure tonight that these people can understand that we're just trying to speak the Word of God, the things that He has promised. And you spoke to them that day about the Word. And when they got to the little inn at the evening, they bid you come in, and when you got inside and closed the door, you did something just like you used to do it before you were crucified. And by that they knew that you had raised again from the dead. Quickly they ran to their brethren and said, Truly the Lord Jesus is raised from the dead. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the road? God, may that be the testimony of these people tonight. That's going back down into the city in different places. Come, Jesus, and speak to our house and do something here tonight that men and women, boys and girls might know that as you read it from the Bible, the way you acted back there in that day and claim you're the same today, act in your church tonight the same, Father, that the people might say on their road home tonight, did not our hearts burn within us as he spake to us in the way? Grant it, Lord, and praise shall be thine in the name of thy Son, Jesus. Amen. Now this is the moment when I'm going to ask if you have to leave for the next 15 to 20 minutes, you should go now. I don't want moving around while the Holy Spirit, if he comes, to act. You see, he, you must be perfectly ready and watch and listen. So if you're going to leave, I would do it now so you won't interrupt the meeting. They take me from the meeting when there's interruptions. And now, if you're a critic or an unbeliever, I would not stay in this type of meeting while this is going on, because any Bible reader knows that evil spirits go from one to another, we, as we but that. So it's not plain church. Here a few nights ago, you'd have heard an Ananias and Sapphira that hadn't been for the mercies of God. And how many times have you people heard, it's read at the services, how things take place like that during the time of the meeting. So be real reverent, white, deep seated, loving, be in prayer. Now, I believe, did you say it was, what pair of cards, a hundred, did you get out? What, why is a hundred? All right, we can't bring them all up at once. I would ask them for prayer cards, why? One, two, three, four, five. Let them come first. How, can we bring them to this way, sir? Who has prayer card Y number one? Would you raise your hand? If you can get up. Now, if you can't, someone will pack you. Prayer card, turn it over. It's a little bitty square card with a number and a letter. Do you have that, lady? Y number one? Y? Like Y O U? Y number one. Raise your hand wherever you are. In the middle, the young woman there, come over here, sister. Why number two? Would you raise up your hand? Look at your neighbor's card. It may be deaf, dumb. He can't even speak or hear. You got number two? Come right here, lady. Number three? Prayer card number three. Would you raise your hand, please? Would you come over here, lady? Number four? Just raise up your hands quickly so we can see where we're at. Number four? Prayer card, way up in the balcony, all right, number four, come right on down. Prayer card, number four, number five, now the boys come down, mix these cards all up and just give them to you, and that, that's the way we have them. Number five, anybody got prayer card five, shake your hand or wave your hand so we know. All right, six, prayer card six, raise your hand, all right, lady, that's right. Number seven, number seven, eight. Now watch now, so nobody, somebody might get crippled, and when they do, we have to pack them up. You see, if it's somebody deaf and dumb, 
8, 9, 10, 9, 10, all right, 11, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Good, sir. All right. All right. Now, while they're coming, let me speak to you again. This other way, lady, if you will. Right around here. Come on, Miss Lady. Form your hand. All right. While, they're speak while I'm speaking and they're lining up just for a moment, now I'm going to ask that everyone be just as reverent and quiet as you can. Now, I know that many times God blesses the people and they stream out. That's perfectly all right. I'm a southerner. I'm used to that. See? That doesn't bother. But now, don't take any pictures that are light flash or anything. Just be reverent because the Holy Spirit is a light. How many knows that? Knows by the Scripture it is a light. Now, how many in here that does not have a prayer card? Anywhere in the building, no matter where you are, you do not have a prayer card, yet you want Jesus to heal you. Raise up your hand. Say, I want Jesus to heal me. Raise your hand, please, so I just kind of get a general conception. All right? That's very fine. All right? Now, be real reverent. Now, the thing, if you don't get up here on the platform, you just look up to Christ and say, Lord Jesus, if this man has told me truth, which I believe he has, then you speak to me. And I'm not, don't try to press yourself now. Just relax and say, Lord, I confess my sin. All that I have done wrong, forgive me for it, and heal me, dear God. Grant me. See how merciful God is. And now, that uh, everyone in here, as far as I know, is a total stranger to me. So it's people that might be sitting by. The only persons that I know in this building is Mr. Sweet, Dr. Vale, and my boy, ever, I think I've seen him standing back there in the dark, I'm not sure. That's the only ones that I know. How many here strange to me raise up your hands? I don't know, you know nothing about. In the prayer line, the same way. Now, all right. Now we're going to either find the word to be the truth or it's not the truth. We need to be telling the truth or not the truth. God only deals with truth. We know that. A person can profess anything they wish to, but if God don't back it up and say it's the truth, then it's wrong. I claim that his word is the same and he remains the same and can never be nothing else but the same God and have to act the same way that he has always did. And if he will do that, here on the platform, out to the audience, and declare himself the risen Jesus, if you all will love him and believe him, Say amen to him. God bless you. Now, after speaking, I'm sure you realize that where I'm standing, what a position I'm in. God, who is my solemn judge, knows this woman or any of you people who I haven't called in the prayer line or something, I do not know you. Then something's got to act now. Or the Scripture is wrong because I've read these things out of the Scripture, which is a promise of God. Do you believe that's the truth? Say amen. It's a promise of God. He promised he'd do it. He don't have to do it, but he has to do it on the way of saying he promised he'd do it. That's what he does. He, does, he didn't have to heal when he was on earth, but he did it that it might be fulfilled. That's what he's doing today. To end up the Gentile age, Return to the Jews, the church goes home, destruction comes to the world, there's your annihilation and gone. And you see, the only thing it would take to happen tonight is a few drinks of vodka. It's already trained. Nothing you can do about it. Of course, we got the same thing to shoot back that way. What does it do? Throw the world from our orbit, just like the Bible says, the way she goes. You remember what Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man? Anybody ever read that? Say amen. What was it? Before Lot was destroyed or the Sodom was destroyed, there was an angel come to the elected, which was Abraham. Is that right? And when he did, he sat down with his back turned to the tent and he said to Sarah, or he said to Abraham, about according to time of life, I'm going to visit you. Sarah's going to have this baby that you've waited for for 25 years. And Sarah, back in the tent, behind the tent, behind the angel, 
smiled. And the angel said, Why did Sarah laugh? How many have ever read that? Why did Sarah laugh? What was he, a fortune teller? Telepathy? Remember, that angel had the last message that Sodom received before she was destroyed. As it was, said Jesus, in the days of Sodom. I remember, it's the presence of the angel of God, the Holy Ghost, that's here today with every scientific and sign and wonder that he's ever promised to fulfill it to you people. You Christians should be happy. Now, I turn to the woman. Now, ladies, you and I being a strange to each other, and this is our first time meeting. I'm years older than you, and this is our first time of ever meeting. But this to the audience, when you read St. John 4, look at this. Exactly the same thing. Our Lord met a woman that he had never seen before in his life. And is that a little panoramic, as I said a while ago, like this? Now here she is, and he found where her trouble was. And told her what her trouble was. And she said, this is the Messiah. Now me not knowing you, my sister, I don't know whether you're Christian or you're infidel. What your life is, what it's been, I, I don't know. I have no way of knowing. I don't know nothing about you. But it's something the supernatural powers of God through this angel here will come. And if I said to you, lady, you're sick, you're going to get well, go ahead. You just have my word. That's all you know about it, which that could be all right. But if he comes and tells you something back in your life, you'll know whether that's the truth or not. You'll be the judge of that. So if he knows what has been, he certainly would know. If he could tell you what was, you'd have confidence to know that what he says will be, will be. Correct? Because it would be God. Would you believe it would be him, Jesus? You would believe it. May the Lord grant it. He's my prayer. Now, as the audience waits reverently, and you are a reverent group of people, here is the hour. Now, if you, if the woman... Honestly, in her heart, she knows that something's going on. She could not feel the way she feels now, standing before a man. I'd be a man just like your father, brother, husband. But there's something that's just again happening, a real humble, sweet feeling coming to you. That is right. If that's right, raise up your hands. This angel, you see his picture, between you and I, is this real life. The woman is not standing here for herself. She's standing here for somebody else. Nothing wrong with a woman outside of a nervousness. She's a nervous type of person that worries about things, crossing bridges before you get to them. But you're here for somebody else. That's true. If the Lord God will reveal to me what you're here for, would you believe him to be the Messiah and will go tell others the Messiah still lives? You will. You believe the little eye will come straight of the child? Crooked eye, cross. You believe it, he'll make, if you make it well? You will believe it? You've got something else on your heart too, haven't you? Besides that child. It's your mother. She's dying. She's got cancer. That is true. And you're worried about her salvation because she's Catholic. That is true. Don't worry. Have faith. Send her that handkerchief. Don't doubt. You have what you ask for. God bless you. Go and believe now and receive. God bless you. Do you believe? Now ask the woman. She may be. You know her. Be irreverent now, please. Do you realize, minister brother? That the Christ that you and I have stood for, me as a Baptist preacher for 27 years in the ministry, that's his presence here now to confirm just exactly. How many know that just the way he did when he was here on earth? Let's see you raise your hands. You people anywhere. The Bible. That's what God's Word says. Then, if this is the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, if it is the one that was here on earth and said, the works that I do shall you uh, uh, also when I'm gone, I'll be with you even in you. That same vine would bear the same 
fruit, would it not? Well, here it is doing the same thing. Don't disbelieve. Every one of you right now should believe. We are strangers to each other, I suppose, ladies. The first time ever meeting in life. If I could help you and wouldn't do it, I'd be a cruel person. But I, I got an old mother home tonight. And I, I love her. And I left family, mother, and all to come here to try to help, to make life a little more pleasant to people, and do all that I could as his servant. If the Lord God would tell me what you're here for, would you believe me and believe it it was him doing it? Would the audience believe it? The lady, she suffers with a nervous condition. She has heart trouble. And she's got very coarse veins. That's exactly the truth. Do you believe now? You say, Mr. Brand, you guessed that. I did not. God knows that. Let's speak to her a little further. If you doubt it, may the Lord grant it. Yes, there's somebody else here that's in need too. That's your husband. He's dying. Must die right away. If God doesn't help him, he's got leukemia. That's cancer in the bloodstream. That's right. That's right. Your name is Miss Harford. Your name is Rose and his is Robert. That's the truth. Go on your road. Believe God and live, lady. Believe God. Jesus Christ who's present. Do you know that's him here? Well, accept him now as your healer for both. You go on your road. And may the Lord God richly bless you, my sister. Do you believe? Have faith. Don't down. I just believe in the audience. We're strangers to each other, I suppose, ladies. First time we've met. It, now, you're, if you're sick, I, I couldn't do nothing about it because I'm just a man. But God can do something about it. Now, if Jesus is standing here with this suit on. You'd say, Lord Jesus, heal me. He'd say, I've already done it. See, healing is something like salvation is past. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes, we were healed. It's already finished in the atonement. We just believe it. There's nothing I could do. See? It'd be what he could. He's already did. It's your faith. Uh, he might tell you something to make you believe it. He was the Messiah. And then by that, you'd believe his atonement was right. And here's what he promised you to do. Work right through it. You are a believer. Christian believer. You could have been an infidel. Critic. But you're not. Same thing with this woman. Is that woman sitting right down there? See. A black demon power. This woman suffering from a real strenuous condition. It's exactly right. Nervous. And you're always scared. You got heart trouble. And that's right. And you're nervous and got a scary condition. Then you're scared too. You've had a something happen to you here some time ago. You had a knot taken or a growth off from the head. And it's coming back again. That little lady sitting there suffering with a mental nervousness. That's right. That's right, young lady. Do you believe that God will make you well too? Yes. Do you believe it? You do raise up your hand if you believe it. You're both healed. <clears throat> Go on your own rejoicing. Jesus Christ makes you well. Don't fear about it no more. It's all over now. No hope. You're just lying. The demon was. But he's gone from you now. Just go believe him. Having faith. Do you love him? He's the great Alpha and the Omega. Uh, something else happened just then. Be real reverent. Please. There's a lady sitting next to the inn there with her hands up like this. 
She's suffering with eye trouble. She's got trouble with her eyes, and she's got heart trouble also. You were praying, wasn't you, lady? The lady standing right there next to the man that's... Uh, uh, turn around and look at his wife. Raise up your hand, lady. That's true. I don't know you, do I, lady? I'm a stranger to you. Do you believe now that you're going to be all right? All right. Go home. Forget about it. Give God praise. Your faith makes you well. I challenge you to believe it. Watch. Be reverent now. Don't move around. Lady, are we strangers to each other? You're weary, upset. Oh, it's about this lad. That's what you got him here for. You just brought him here. That is true. If the Lord our God will reveal to me what you're so worried about this lad, will you accept it? You believe it comes from the Lord our God? The boy's up for an operation. And the doctor says there's a growth around his heart that must be taken out. That's true, isn't it? And you're worried about it. If God is here and knows about the child, isn't he interested in you? Will you accept him as your child to live and you'll raise him for the glory of God? Let us pray. Dear God, I claim the life of this child through Jesus Christ. May he be well. May the mother be blessed. And may the community be blessed. For we ask this in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Don't worry now. Have faith, honey boy. You'll be all right. Come, lady. I do not know you. The Lord God does know you. If he were to reveal to me what your trouble is, will you accept him as your healer? You're suffering with a stomach trouble and a liver trouble. The liver's really causing it. Draining out the gall into the stomach and throwing it into a spasm. That's right. And I see you doing something trying to taste. Well, you haven't got any taste. You've lost your sense of taste. You don't have any taste or any smell either one. That's true. You believe you have it now? Go ahead. That's right. God bless you. There's many in this building suffering with the same thing you are. But God lives in the heart. You believe he can heal heart trouble and make you well? You believe it? Let us pray. Lord God, spare this woman for your glory, as I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't you fear. Go believe in it now with all your heart. Don't doubt. You had the same thing. So just keep moving, believing God. Are you believing out in the audience? Please now, be just as reverent as you can. Reverent, please, everyone. You believe God would heal you of that arthritis sitting there, sir, and make you well? The elderly gentleman sitting there with the little photo, you believe that God will make you well? You do? Say you that uh, touched him then. <clears throat> You're a fine man. You believe your leg trouble will get all right? Your name is Mr. Young now, and you can go home and be well. That is true, isn't it? All right. That was just something to slip up so that I could catch you. I see it was you believing to begin with. <laughs> Are you believing? The lady... Sitting down here, the second lady, kind of heavy set, suffering with high blood pressure, looking right at me in the first row there. You believe the Lord God makes you well, sister? You believe it? Could you accept it as your healing? Raise your hand up if you accept it. That's it. Raise your handkerchief way up high. Don't be ashamed of faith like that. You could touch God. Have faith. 
way down at the end of the row, sitting there between two men, the lady with high blood pressure, the second row back, the end, do you believe that Jesus Christ will heal you at your high blood pressure? It happened to be, I've seen a streak lead this lady and go to you. That's the reason I know that you can be healed if you want to accept it. I challenge your faith. Here's a dear soul sitting here, right back there behind me. Still that little black hat on. Got trouble with her head. She's praying about it. <clears throat> that is right, isn't it, sister? Right here. The little lady with a black hat on and glasses. You're having trouble in your head. But you don't feel it now, do you? You were healed just then. <clears throat> the lady sitting next to you looks like a... You believe, lady? I just want to contact your spirit. Lay your hand over on the lady next to you there. The lady was just healed. Lay your hand on the next lady. Yeah. You believe the Lord God will heal you, lady? You have complications, many things wrong with you, such as diabetes for one, heart trouble for another. That's right. That's right. Raise your hand. All right. Go home. Believe it to be over. It will leave. That infection, the little lady sitting below you there, do you believe that you'll be healed, that infection, lady? You do, the little lady there? Mrs. Hunter from Caribou. Raise up. I don't know you do, a lady. I've never seen you, have I? I know my voice is rebounding. We are strangers to one another. If we are, raise up your hand. That's right. Are those things right which were said? All right, go back home and be well. Jesus Christ heals you. What do you think about it, lady? You believe that you heal now? Go on to your road rejoicing. That's the way to do it. Amen. Nervous trouble, which caused your hearts to flutter and so forth. That's right, really, which is an indigestion. There's a lot of that in here. How many suffer? Let me show you. How many of you are suffering with nervous trouble? Raise your hands just a minute. See, how are you going to call that? See, it's just everywhere. All of you with nervous trouble, stand up to your feet. Stand up to your feet if you want to accept Christ right now. Listen, stand right over here just a minute. Come here, lady, or the man. Come here, sir. I don't know you, do I? We're strangers. Now, sorts of people knows it's not reading a mind. Lay your hand on mine. If God will reveal to me this way what's your trouble, you accept it? You will? Stomach trouble. Raise up your hand if that's right. Every person with stomach trouble, stand to your feet. All over the building, stand to your feet with stomach trouble. Stand right here a minute, sir. You'll see the glory of God. If thou canst believe, back trouble, stand right back here. All with back trouble, get up to your feet. I don't care how long you've been paralyzed or laying down, stand up to your feet. You can see the glory of God. Are you believing that his presence is here? Do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is present? If y'all raise up your hands, everybody in the building. Stand up to your feet, each one of you then. Stand up, everyone. I don't care if you couldn't get up a few minutes ago, you can now. Raise up. There you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, I claim that Christ died for you at Calvary, which forgives your sins and heals your sickness. His presence, who is here now, to claim that he has raised from the dead, has declared with infallible proof that he remains today and cannot die. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All that believe that, raise your hands. The Bible said it promised that he would be here in these days to do these things. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. How many is a believer? They shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. Put your hands on somebody next to you if you're a believer. These signs shall follow them that believe. That's what the scripture says. There you are in a perfect unity of spirit, perfect unity with hands laid on you, perfect unity with the Holy Ghost, perfect unity with the power of God, perfect unity in the scripture, then it's got to be over. Let us bow our heads while we all offer prayer to God. Lord God, we thank you for your great presence, the Holy Ghost, that's now here to take over and to rule every sickness from this building. Oh, Satan, you have lost the battle. You deceived the people down through the ages, but the hour has come where you are exposed. Come out of these people's sickness. I charge you by the name of Jesus Christ, 
who is sure to defeat you and has defeated you, leave this audience in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of the people. All that accepts God as your healer, Christ as your healer, raise your hands to him. Amen. Fine, give us a quarter, I will praise him. Everyone now, just shut yourself in and let's worship him. All right. I will praise him. All together now.